Hi, my name is Dr. Ian Ralby, and on behalf of the Board of the Directors of the Henry Clay Center, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this third series in our Craft of Compromise events. As an organization, we are guided by the values of honesty, courage, and civility. And we are constantly reflecting on how we can meaningfully contribute to helping address some of the most complex challenges facing our society. Democracy is messy but that's part of the beauty of it. We all cherish our freedoms, but we cherish them in complex and dynamic competition and tension with all of our fellow human beings and certainly our fellow citizens. So we are always engaged in a constant negotiation for our how to become a more just, more equal, and ultimately a more prosperous society. Along the way, we have to find common ground that gives us the footing to take the steps forward towards those ideals. And that's where compromise comes in. Henry Clay, in addition to being my five times great grandfather, was perhaps our most skillful political negotiator in US history. But he is certainly our most famous compromiser. That is not to say that he was weak or prone to caving in on his positions nor is it a commentary on the wisdom or goodness of those positions. Rather, it is the reason that at the Henry Clay Center, we reflect on and try to emulate the skills that he brought to public life and seek to discern how they can be applied to today's challenges. In the first session of the Craft of Compromise, we spoke with former senators Trent Lott and Tom Daschle about the skills and values they brought to the table and found most necessary in negotiating compromise and resolution of disputes during their time presiding over the last 50-50 Senate. In the last session, we discussed what racial justice actually means, whether it's achievable in our lifetimes, and whether the concept of compromise is even applicable to something as fundamental as racial justice. Those sessions were recorded and I commend them to you. They are available on the Henry Clay Center YouTube channel, as will this session be after today's discussion. And that brings us to the conversation we are looking forward to having now. When Henry Clay negotiated the Treaty of Ghent with the British in 1814 to end the War of 1812, it drew a close to the first great test of the durability of the American experiment and whether we could actually defend that experiment. Years later, when Henry Clay was Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams, he actually supported the self-determination efforts of states that had not yet been established and which are close partners in which we continue to have close relations uh, today. A lot has changed since then and a lot is continuing to change. America has gone from a fledgling experiment meeting its peers for the first time to now a global superpower. But a lot is changing that makes that position somewhat in question. The post-Cold War dynamics wherein the United States was a unitary superpower are arguably over. We have a number of global and regional near peers that are providing ample competition to question whether we can really claim to be a unitary power. And furthermore, a variety of both non-state and quasi-state actors have ushered in a range of new security challenges and threats that seek to topple the conventional notion of how we defend ourselves as a country. At the same time, over the last few years, we have retracted from our position that we had acquired as a bit of a, a global security presence. And we've eschewed that role. And at the same time, spent more than ever on bolstering our defenses. So that brings us to the overlapping uh, concerns of how we engage with the rest of the world and yet protect and defend ourselves at home. And that is what today's conversation is fundamentally about. So this is the overarching prompt for the day. How do we clarify the military and the diplomatic roles for US foreign engagement? To answer that and related questions, I am absolutely delighted to welcome now our fantastic group of speakers for today. Let me introduce them in turn. Uh, Ambassador Greta Holtz, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting in 
2014 when she was ambassador to Oman. Uh, and I have enjoyed getting to uh, know her better over the years. And I am absolutely delighted she's with us today because she brings to the table a wealth of experience, both in the State Department and overseas as ambassador to Oman. And uh, most recently, up until last month, chargé in Qatar. She has also spent time at National Defense University and in senior positions uh, within the State Department, particularly uh, the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Ambassador Mitchell Reese is the reason I chose William & Mary for my law school education. Uh, he was a professor there in, uh, in 2002 when I began and he promptly left after I arrived in order to become <laughs> Director of Policy Planning at the State Department under then Secretary of State Colin Powell. Uh, he was special envoy in uh, Northern Ireland and has engaged on behalf of the United States in places all around the world, uh, has advised some of our most senior leaders over the years. Uh, he was vice provost of international affairs at William & Mary. Uh, he was president of Washington College in Maryland, and he was most recently CEO of Colonial Williamsburg. And he brings to the table a tremendous uh, diversity of experiences that I think will help enrich the conversation today. Now, I uh, had hoped to also be introducing my good friend and, uh, and colleague, Mike Franken, uh, who was the deputy at uh, US Africa Command uh, several years ago and was a, a recent candidate for Senate in Iowa, uh, where he talked extensively about voting against the Iraq war, but I'm afraid he has not been able to join us at the last minute today. Uh, so we will we will think of him as we discuss this, but uh, he, he won't be able to join us, unfortunately. However, we do have fantastic military representatives today, and so I'm so happy to invite uh, and, and introduce, rather, uh, Captain Kirk Hibbert, uh, the real Captain Kirk, as I like to say, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting in uh, 2016 in Norfolk at a NATO event, um, and uh, have, have enjoyed getting to know not only him, but his daughter, who was also a William & Mary alum, um, and uh, he uh, has amazing experience as having been both base commander at Guantanamo Bay and uh, the, the U.S. Navy's liaison at, at the State Department. And so he has a, a really uh, extensive military background that, that um, is quite distinguished, but also has seen uh, how that parallels with our diplomatic efforts at, at State. And uh, very importantly, uh, I'm delighted to, to introduce uh, First Lieutenant Michael Lowe, who is a 2019 alum of the Henry Clay Center uh, Student Congress, and he is now, on behalf of the United States Army, stationed in uh, Lithuania. So welcome to all of you, uh, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Let me begin by posing a, a pretty uh, foundational question. We, we tend to like to start our conversations with a definition. So in the first series, we, we talked about what is compromise? Last time we talked about what is racial justice. Um, and so I want to get to what is uh, the role of the military and what is the role of the State Department or the diplomatic corps in our uh, foreign policy. But just to introduce that concept, I think it's important to note that over the last few decades, the military has developed a range of new programs for language and cultural studies, has developed a, a fantastic program, program called the Foreign Area Officer Program or FAO program that, that means that we have military officers around the world who speak the language, who know the culture, who have lived with families uh, and who have really made it their job to study and understand the context in which they are operating. Uh, and that has been in parallel with a major increase in, in what is often called military diplomacy, uh, particularly in recent years where uh, State Department spending has decreased and uh, where uh, the military has taken on a, a range of new diplomatic uh, roles. At the same time, the State Department has, over the last two decades, expanded massively its, its involvement in and focus on security. Um, and so it has looked at all kinds of security-related assistance uh, through a variety of different bureaus, including uh, counterterrorism, anti-terrorism assistance, international narcotics and law enforcement. Um, and at the same time, it has also uh, been hiring its own security uh, for different operations in complex environments around the world. So to all of you, to anyone who wants to, to take the first stab, uh, in your own words, what are the respective roles of the military and of the diplomatic corps in our foreign engagement? 
So uh, before I get started, um, Dr. Ralby, uh, thank you for that uh, introduction for, for all of us. I am very honored uh, to uh, be here with uh, both Ambassador Holtz and, and Reese and uh, First Lieutenant Lowe. I would trade a, a lot of things that, uh, that I own just to be where you are right now. Uh, honestly, I, I envy you. I envy you. Um, take everything you, you can and just listen to what uh, the older folks here have to say. Um, you, you're you're going to be in our shoes uh, one of these days uh, soon. Um, so, so just to, to answer the question as simply as I could, um, we all have our own tradecraft between diplomacy and and military, uh, and 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 I want to make sure that that we are not di diluting what we. Um, when we look specifically at the military, although we have a lot of different um, uh, things that we do, as as Dr. Ralby was alluding to with, with FAO and, and so on, um, we are designed, we are created to be able to provide the protection of the motherland. And, and that may be um, at the motherland, it may be the approaches to the motherland, and it may be overseas. Um, please do not get that that confused. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of my my years training to go to war uh, and to and to I guess dare I quote uh, Clausewitz uh, by uh, enacting policy by other means. Um, the other the other side of this the, the diplomacy um, it's it's a, a statescraft. It is a the ability for for us to essentially uh, engage throughout the world and, and understand those cultures and to be, and to be able to uh, convey uh, some, somewhat of a, of a connection. Um, and, I, and I must say, I believe that we have to have diplomacy in place and it's not necessarily one or the other. It is diplomacy should lead before we go to, to, uh, to military. Uh, and, and I think, uh, let me give, uh, my, my other colleagues an opportunity to, to weigh in on that. Over to you. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just jump in on that. Thank you very much uh, from me to Ian uh, for inviting us all today. It is quite an honor for me to be sharing the screen with everybody. Um, lots of amazing uh, expertise and experience out there. Um, if you believe that statecraft is how you, uh, the strategy of power, and you look at the different um, elements of statecraft, um, military, the military is really the, the fist of statecraft. The so war is the ultimate argument of the state and it's uh, diplomacy is the peaceful advancement of all of our national interests short of war. So it's to, to avoid having to use those fists. So um, diplomats overseas, our, our job is the tactical implementation of the strategies that are created back in Washington by the National Security Council, by the interagency, by the president and his team. Um, State Department in Washington, like, like DOD, we are members of the, um, the body politic that devises the strategy, but as diplomats overseas, we, we orchestrate and implement uh, and inform the policy decisions. So I would say that diplomacy, if, if our job is to advance economic, uh, cultural, military, and political interests uh, on behalf of the state, then that incorporates uh, the use of our military tools short of war. Thank you. I, that actually reminds me of, of a quote somebody uh, sent me yesterday uh, from uh, the Prussian King Frederick the Great, uh, who said, diplomacy without arms is like music without instruments. So um, a, a very uh, apt um, uh, quote for, for that comment. Uh, Mitchell, do you want to add to that? Sure, uh, just sort of taking a step back and just more broadly uh, thinking about the State Department's role uh, in the world. And I think it really falls into three general baskets. I think the first is to explain and promote and execute US foreign policies to overseas audiences. The second is to understand the world and to convey that information, that knowledge, that understanding back to decision makers in Washington and to the American public writ large. And then the third basket is what you might call housekeeping. It has to do with visas and passports and helping Americans stranded overseas. I always felt that I had 
the full force, the whole moral authority of the United States people behind me. It's just, it's, it's a remarkable feeling when you are representing the United States overseas, you really do feel that you are a tribune of 330 million Americans. And it, it's just very empowering. And I, I think it actually makes itself felt on the, at the negotiating table. I think the other side feels it also. So short of relying on the military, which we want to keep in reserve um, and never a first or second option, I think that there's a third of moral authority that um, the U.S. is the world's leading democracy, um, the values and the, the founding principles, I think that those still resonate around the world. I think that that awesome power of, of, of speaking on behalf of the United States people is, is uh, something to really consider. And, and for those who haven't experienced it, uh, putting yourselves in the shoes of somebody who, who has not only that power, but that responsibility, uh, I think is really a, a useful um, uh, thought experiment, if, if not um, experience to try to, uh, to empathize with. So um, I, I want to, uh, before I turn to, to uh, Michael Lowe, I want to welcome Vice Admiral Mike Franken, who has been able to join us. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Um, I, uh, I did give you a quick introduction, but I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, Vice Admiral Franken, in addition to having been uh, the deputy uh, military commander at U.S. Africa Command uh, at the end of his very distinguished military career, uh, has held commands of, of uh, a, a wide variety of, of both vessels and positions um, and is uh, a really uh, distinguished military expert uh, with whom I, I think uh, I have really enjoyed working in quite a few different parts of the world. We actually met in I think Lagos, Nigeria, at the Nigerian Navy's Diamond Jubilee. Uh, so um, it, it's been uh, tremendous getting to know you, him over the years, and uh, I'm delighted to have him part of the conversation. And just to catch him up, we are speaking about what are the military and diplomatic roles uh, right now before we get into where they overlap and, and what we can clarify. Um, so um, Michael Lowe uh, is is uh, stationed in, in Lithuania right now. So. Um, Michael, do you want to do you want to say anything to your experience as somebody who is right now um, at the uh, at the coal face, so to speak? Uh, yes, and first I just want to thank you for having me in, and um, I feel honored to be here amongst uh, very senior people. I have my notepad, so we're going to be doing a lot more listening than talking. So um, don't <laughs> don't take my quietness as not wanting to participate. It's just that we have a lot of ex experience here on the panel right now, and uh, I want to soak it all in. Um, as far as it goes on, on my end, the way, uh, at least in my very short tenure in the, in the Army right now, um, is that th there's no dichotomy, right? Um, I, I think as we advance further along the spectrum of war, just as a, a Captain Kirk uh, Hibbert was, was pointing out, um, the military is there to enforce policy by other means. Uh, and as you move along that spectrum from total peace with, you know, uh, say our relationship with Lithuania, down to our uh, total war, uh, say with, in World War II, or in that gray area in between, say with Russia, um, the military plays a bigger part as you increase along that spectrum. So right now, uh, as you were saying too, Ian, that um, with the shortening of the budget of the State Department, the military is filling that role a little bit. And certainly in Lithuania, that is the case. Uh, we had a meeting with the embassy today, actually, regarding some projects and some operational um, issues that we need to discuss at that level. Um, and it was all military officials from our side representing that. Um, even the embassy liaisons were, were from the military. Um, so because it's at this level of that spectrum of warfare, uh, the military can, can kind of handle that. Um, and because of those budget cuts, but it's, it's not a dichotomy at all. We, we need each other to, to work. And that's just been my experience so far. Thanks very much. And Admiral Franken, you've kind of uh, operated throughout that spectrum over the course of your career. Uh, do you want to share any initial reflections on, on where the lines are between uh, the diplomatic corps and the military? Well, thank you, Ian, and sorry for being the, the Zoom problem child this, uh, this afternoon. I, I, I thought I graduated from that. Um, so, so the short of it is I, I began early on in my career in a rather confrontational situations, uh, entirely unbeknownst to me walking into that uh, in, the, in the wake of the Panama invasion 
and seeing uh, being rather uh, at odds with the diplomatic corps and the humanitarian corps from a military perspective. That has mutated over the years, uh, at times good, at times not, not so good, to a point now where an enhanced military perspective on, on security cooperation has sometimes resulted in a more subdued position from State Department. Now that's not good either. So I would like to see as we go forward a more energetic participation in every, every line from, from, from the, the six or so different areas in security cooperation, a more energetic side for State Department participation where they have veto authority. Uh, and and don't take a back seat to the military uh, as the experts in the region. Well, and you mentioned that veto authority, and that kind of comes to the, the question of interagency balancing. And and you, you highlight very well that it's changed over time. And I've seen that uh, in, in the course of, of my career as well, uh, albeit uh, a bit shorter. Um, and uh, I, I uh, wonder if if either Ambassador Holtz or, or Ambassador Reese would like to to speak to why it is that the uh, State Department may take a back seat at times, even when they have uh, either statutory or, or lead agency authority, um, and, and where that balancing uh, occurs and, and, and how we get them to have a more uh, robust and active role, as, as Admiral Franken is suggesting. I'll take a stab at that. Um, so when I was the Senior Foreign Policy Advisor at Special Operations Command, um, the command wanted state input into many, many things. And part of my role was to be the um, facilitator, the coordinator, the, the uh, you know, help, help the relationship between the command and State Department on, uh, th this was at the point when we were looking at um, North Korea, possible military action, many, many things that, that so come to us. We literally did not have enough people, our, our China Bureau, our East Asia Pacific Bureau, they wanted to play a role, they were keen to do so. We didn't have enough people, we didn't have enough time in the day. SOCOM could send up 20 guys to do this beautiful presentation. We had no human beings who were able to hear the presentation, much less be part of the dialogue. So there's the, the you know, the balance between hours in the day, number of human beings, it's budget related, of course, but there were many, many, many times when we wanted to, we should have played an active role. We literally did not have the people. So I think, you know, it, it goes down to some of the things we all know, the budget, the size, the capacity issues that we have. There are, there are probably many more people in the SOCOM headquarters than there are in our entire East Asia Pacific Bureau. So if you're looking at, you know, the implications of military action in North Korea, what's China going to do, what, how does this play out with Taiwan, and you need to have a state voice in there, you, you have no people. So I think there's a scale issue. That, that's one of the, one of the um, fundamental problems. Maybe Ambassador Reese probably has more. No, I think that's a totally valid point. I think that in addition to that sort of structural personnel slash budget reason, um, there's a related one, which is training. The military spends a lot more time and money and effort on training its people than the State Department has. I know under Secretary Powell, he tried to get some leadership training for the first time uh, in the State Department for folks. So I think that there's what you might want to call an expertise gap. I I used to wonder how many people at state when I was there knew the difference between a brigade and a battalion. And not many, I think, is the answer. And I'm not sure if that's changed much. So uh, as the ambassador said, you're so busy focusing on what your inbox is telling you to do each day at state, you simply don't have time. It's a capacity issue. But there, there are some ways of dealing with it, I think. And it has to do with uh, coordinating better between state and defense. Um, having uh, one of the things I've wondered about is why the, the new recruits, the, the uh, folks that are new ambassadors or the young generals um, couldn't train together uh, doing a, a six month course at the National War College, for example, or even earlier in their careers, getting to know each other because uh, you're gonna be overlapping. And again, we all know how important personal relationships are. The trust factor is essential. So again, I think that there are some ways to restructure uh, the whole career path that you have people um, actually getting to know each other so that when you show up at an embassy, you meet uh, you know, a two-star for the first time, you, you have a pre-existing relationship. 
So I, I think that there are a few ways in which state can do better on this. I, I think that's a really great point. Uh, Michael, do you want to speak to that? Because uh, you, you are sort of in that younger generation who, uh, who maybe should be training alongside. Yeah, so I don't mean to take over your kind of role in this, Ian, but I do want to ask a question to the panel as well, because from my perspective, it does seem that um, uh, the strategic view of uh, policymakers at top is that, um, especially on the Army side, is that they're kind of developing the officers to be able to either progress in the military or transition over to a state role. And in that, in that way, they can uh, use the funds that they're diverting from the you know, Department of State to kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone, if you will. So that's just, that's my perspective. Is, is that uh, kind of missing the mark? Because uh, as a cadet, for example, I visited uh, Latvia um, for a training exercise. And it was part of a new program, a uh, global officer program, which uh, is Project GO, as well as um, uh, COLP, which was what I was part of, was cadet leadership program. And uh, the big overarching theme of it is to get young cadets, even cadets before we're lieutenants, to experience the world, experience different languages, so that we can become global officers. And that's kind of the, the strategic vision for the Army. Um, so. Is, is that kind of what you guys are seeing at your level? Is that what the career progression is, is, is looking towards? Or is that just something that I, uh, I'm missing the mark on? Great question. Anyone want to take that? Well, if, if I could add one second on that. Um, so the DOD was faced with a myopic perspective from each service's um, role. And consequently, we made mistakes and we rectified that as best we could with the uh, Goldwater Nichols Act, where we mandated jointness. If we want as a nation to have a comprehensive approach internationally in development, defense and diplomacy, I suggest we mandate in DOD for those officers involved in this activity that you have a joint time, yes, but also interagency time. And, uh, and some of us were fortunate to get some of that. Others have stumbled through it. And I would expect some cross-pollination and obviously state doesn't have the people to do this to the degree that we do, but they have empty desks up there on the seventh floor that we could perhaps uh, cross-pollinate. And I think that would go a long ways to improving uh, our ability to have that comprehensive approach and understanding from each perspective. So Ian, can I add an anecdote and then a comment? The anecdote was when I was leading policy planning, I met with my counterpart over at the Pentagon. And what I wanted to do was to have an exchange of people. I wanted to know what he was thinking, how he saw the world. And I thought he would be interested in how we in the State Department were looking at the world. Uh, he was all for it. Uh, and we were gonna get together with monthly brown bag lunches and the like, but um, it went up the chain of command and it got shut down. So that may be idiosyncratic. It doesn't mean that you don't try it again and try to institutionalize it like the ambassador is saying. It's just when we did try to do it, this was 15 years ago, it didn't work. So um, just an anecdote, it, it doesn't mean that that's the way it has to be for all time. The, the one thing I would suggest though, if we are going to be better in terms of jointness, that we see the geography the same way. My understanding is that state and defense don't divide the world up the same way. And therefore, and this then plays out in terms of Congress and congressional oversight with committee and subcommittee assignments. And so I think it just adds to the disjointness, the confusion. It's totally an own goal here. This is a problem that we created that we could you know, fix, but I do know it, it just, it's not the way anybody who has a rational uh, bone in their body would draw this thing up. I, I think that's a, a point that resonates very strongly with my experience as well, uh, dealing with the seams and the, the, the mismatched overlaps um, between different regional um, focuses and, and commands. And I think your point about the, uh, the, the chain of command at higher levels uh, cutting out possibilities is also uh, outside of, of even the entities of, of state and defense. And some of it just has to do with our own uh, interagency structures such that the color of money makes it so that we can't spend any money on having a 
civilian with us or a military person with us in, in different contexts. And that makes it very, very difficult uh, to, to accomplish that. Uh, so Kirk, do you wanna, do you wanna speak at all to that as having been one of the people that, that went from the military into a desk at the, at, at the State Department um, and, and how we could uh, leverage the, the, the exchange better uh, to, to make this a much more um, systematic and not just um, you know, one-off a uh, few individuals here and there uh, kind of relationship. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and, and thanks for the, the opportunity again. And uh, Admiral, uh, welcome aboard, sir. Good to good to have you on, on the team. Um, you know, I uh, when I think about how I ended up at uh, at at Guantanamo, it was it was more academic in my mind than it was really um, a military thrust from 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 my thought prospect. Um, and it was because I wanted to really understand. Uh, and, and dare I say it, more of a wider global, well, why are we doing this? Now, you know, my, my responsibility uh, on the base was really about, about the care and feeding of the number of different uh, organiza organizations that was there. And the big, the big organization that was there was the, um, uh, was the, the detention facility. Uh, I happened to be there when there was a little bit more than 6,000 folks that were there. Um, and the interesting thing about it was my additional job while I was there was to actually engage with our uh, Cuban counterparts. Um, and before I went there, I remember receiving a call from, uh, from a gentleman at the State Department who, who called me at my house and said, oh, hey, by the way, hi, Kirk, this is, this is Tom. I said, hey, Tom, how are you? And he, he said, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to be your, um, the, the guy that, uh, that sits with you to talk to the Cubans. And I said, well, Tom, we don't, we don't talk to the Cubans. And he said, no, not only do we talk to the Cubans, but you're talking to the Cubans. Uh, and I, I, I suddenly felt this really cold rush up my back and I realized that I had to get really smart very, very quickly. So what, what do I mean by that? Um, I am very good at the war fighting skills that I had been taught uh, um, you know, through my naval career. And I have experienced uh, both in peacetime and, and in war but I didn't know the things that I really needed to know to be what I would, what I would call a, a diplomat. And I was very happy to have that team with me. Um, and it opened up an opportunity for me to see the world a little bit differently. And not, not, that, not that I haven't had an opportunity to, to deploy all over the world, but by that time I had already I absolutely done so, but this capacity was just a little bit different. Um, so much so that that when the opportunity came to go to the State Department, I, I jumped on it, um, and I recognized that um, that you you can't. I don't think you can look at a Venn diagram in a in a sense and say you know exclusively those two rings or those three rings. So let's just in this case the two rings, diplomacy and military are are disparate. They're not. They overlap. You'll have you'll have places where where we as uniform members act in a diplomatic way. And you may have um, diplomats uh, that may be uh, in engagements in a way that is, is, is not necessarily ag aggressive with, with uh, as we would say, bringing the iron, you know, but it may be those conversations that, you, that you're gonna have that are very aggressive, uh, just, just short of an aggression. Uh, so, so um, I, I don't know that, um, you know, as we go through these budget drills from, from time to time, who's going to get the money to, to have FAOs and, and how we're going to staff the State Department, we're going to ebb and flow. But the reality is, um, it, I, I look at how this, you know, the, the United States has organized, you know, our administration in, in a sense, and it's not perfect. But you know what, I think we do pretty good. Good job, and we, we need to continue. As you said in the beginning, it's a little messy, but this is this is what we do. And and I will say, I, you know, I'm very proud when I do go overseas and I engage with counterparts who look at the United States, and um, and they they kind of marvel in a sense, uh, but they you know they're they're very curious, and and I think that's that's a shining light for them. So you know, with that said, I'm not sure that I'm answering the question, but 
but I, I would say that it's not one or the other, um, and and we should find a way to deal with the mix. Back over I, you. I think that's extremely well put, and um, you know what it what it also speaks to is uh, the importance of humility. Uh, because as, as several of you have, have said, you know, expertise is, is necessary. This is, a, we're talking about complicated, difficult, challenging, and, and vitally important issues. Um, and hubris, arrogance, or, or a know-it-all attitude um, actually just makes it very uh, difficult to, to actually get anything done. Um, and, and so we have to be, be humble in, in recognizing our strengths, recognizing our weaknesses, and working together uh, to, to have collectively as, as a government, as the United States, a, a, as much uh, skill, expertise, and, and understanding as possible to, to have maximum effect in our engagement. And that brings me to a, a question I want to pose to all of you about what is happening now with what is our longest war. Uh, we are in the process now of, of seemingly, uh, we'll see, uh, but uh, disengaging from our 20 year engagement in Afghanistan. And it's helpful to look back and, and reflect on it a bit as it has brought out some issues that we hadn't really ever seen before as a country. Um, in 2008, for example, 69% of the US total force in Afghanistan was actually provided by private contractors. We saw during the course of this war an incredible increase in the use of private companies to deploy our foreign policy and our military and de defense policy overseas. Um, they have sparked all kinds of controversies from the Nisor Square shooting to all kinds of, of concerns about accountability. Uh, and that has not really gone away, though there have been quite a few efforts uh, to address them. Uh, and so it brings us to a point where we may move all our troops out of Afghanistan and yet still have an armed presence there. Um, I don't know if that's in the cards, but, but that is one of the possibilities uh, that has been created by this outsourcing. Uh, and so many believe that these entities are actually attached to the armed forces. They are a military or DOD contractor uh, operating on behalf of the United States Armed Forces. But if we look at some of those instances, including the source where they weren't, they were actually there on behalf of the United States Department of State. And so the diplomatic corps was actually using armed contractors uh, to protect their own uh, people and protect others, but in the process ended up in questionable situations where you could argue that they were directly participating in hostilities during an armed conflict uh, setting. Uh, and so my question is, has outsourcing um, and, and across the spectrum from the non-armed to the, the, the heavily armed, blurred the military and diplomatic roles in armed conflicts uh, as, we, as we look forward to, to future security concerns. So Ian, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, since that incident in Iraq and, and some other incidents, um, State made a big push to hire many more career diplomatic security people so that they would not have to rely as much on contractors. So I'm not, don't, I sound a little defensive, but um, what we learned was that we did not have good accountability. We did not have good control on the contractors, the rules of engagement, whether they were clear or not, they weren't certainly enforced. And so we do still have um, some private security contractors working with us in war zones. Um, or very unstable environments, but the majority of our diplomatic security protection element is now career uh, diplomatic security people. That does not mean that they are not also able to do things that are um, perhaps less, uh, less good for our foreign policy. Undesirable. Um, <laughs> undesirable, not what you want them to be doing. But I think it, it all comes down to um, oversight, accountability, rules of engagement, you know, clear goals, clear communication of what is expected. Um, I think if you're on the receiving end of um, violence from any American, you don't care whether it's a diplomatic security contractor or a career DS guy or an army guy, somebody shot your grandmother. So for the recipient, it, I don't think it matters so much. Maybe within, I don't, so you, is I, in my experience, you're seen as a, it's an American incident, you know, and it's inside the beltway and maybe in America that we make this huge distinction between, you know, what are those contractors doing versus what are our army guys doing. But I think in the, in the host countries where we are using, um, you know, the, the military tool, uh, it doesn't matter to the, to the recipient of that uh, action so much. 
If, if I may say, Ian, that the use of contractors in many ways, and there's a lot of valid reasons to, to be involved in that. And I'm involved with some logistics companies to, to advise them as well. So, but we are really abdicating the responsibility of our elected leaders and by extension, the voting electorate because we have money engaged, but we really don't have the soul of the service member, the person that's sent in harm's way, that uh, we've got to respond to the fathers and mothers of those, of those uh, soldiers. So frankly, um, I also say follow the money. Is this contractor fo following environmental concerns, employment concerns, wh who, how sure are we that they're not being part of the continuation of the struggle? Because there's money in this. Let's, one of the oldest axioms of war is money. Um, are, are they following, as the ambassador said, the rule of armed conflict, proportionality, et cetera? Uh, and, and what accountability do they have for the on-scene commander? And, uh, and where's, where's that allegiance across the, uh, the, to the other contractors that they may be working with or may be required to work with. Frankly, it's always an abdication of a national will. And we have a tendency to slide that way as I think our sense of focus on the conflict wanes. Well, and this brings up uh, in both of, of your comments, the, the issue of appearance. Um, are these appearing uh, as American military and diplomatic personnel to, to others, or are they appearing as something different? You know, internally, we can debate all we want, the legal lines between one actor and another. But as you say, uh, if somebody's killed your grandmother or run over your dog or smashed your car, you don't really care. You want, uh, they're American, this is the US presence. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with mitigating our external and our overseas image and, and appearance and at the same time deal with our internal one, because part of the reason for outsourcing has, has been at least argued to be that we don't have to report troop deaths. We don't have to report certain, uh, certain aspects of it. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case, but image definitely comes into this discussion. And given that, that our image as a country is part of what foreign engagement is, is about, um, how do we balance that? Well, as a person responsible for a lot of people on the ground, numerous cases, uh, what I was wary of is contractors associated with logistics contracts that whose owners live elsewhere under some other flag, not U.S., and uh, what logistics foretell for operations and a security perspective of that. What was, uh, what was being leaked out by the movement of fuel, uh, ammunition, and, and other uh, instruments of, of materiel, which portend operations and what kind of security was being uh, used to the dis as, as those contractors discuss those movements. That's a, that's a very basic issue that we should look at for the long term in the U.S. Ian, the, the easiest way to uh, solve the problem is not to put ourselves in that position in the first place. And that seems to be, I think, more of a bipartisan trend today than it was five or 10 or 15 years ago. So I suspect that, uh, that there will be less opportunities in the future. It's always hard to predict the future, um, but um, it doesn't really answer your question. It just means that perhaps its salience will be a little bit less prominent in the debate as we bring more forces uh, home from overseas. Any other thoughts on that, particularly Michael? I'm, I'm curious if, if you're finding yourself in, engaging with uh, contractors, even for just things like housing and logistics. Yes, uh, so we deal with uh, contractors for just that, really just logistical and uh, housing purposes. Um, as the, we call them FOSS mayors. I'm a FOSS mayor, which pretty much means I manage all the contracts on, on site here. So I work very directly with uh, contractors in that capacity. Um, it doesn't really pertain to the issue of uh, war zones or combat because it's, it's none of that happens here. Um, but um, from the issue of uh, contract doors, uh, yeah, I, I can't really speak to this because it, it's, it's not, 
not what we deal with here. It's just basic living and quality of life issues. Uh, maybe theft <laughs> is more of a, a um, relevant topic. But as far as uh, dealing with those type of issues, I have no experience with that. So, uh, that, And that's very fair. Um, Kirk, I, I, I want to turn to you and, and feel free to answer about the contractors. But I also want to go back to your Venn diagram because you mentioned two circles and you had the military and you had the diplomatic. Um, but in some ways, there's a, a third circle that we haven't yet talked about, which is the intelligence services, uh, which overlap both um, in, in different ways. And uh, this kind of goes to the image uh, issue that we've just been discussing, but um, the reputation of our intelligence services has been called into question publicly in the United States, even by our government in, in recent years. Um, and I'm curious if that reputation at home impacts uh, how people perceive us and, and what their concerns are about not intelligence engagement, but actually diplomatic and military engagement. So, because sometimes people assume there's a blurry line between them. Uh, so uh, I'm just curious your, your thoughts on that third uh, circle. Yeah, the first thing that, uh, that comes to mind, uh, you know, with, with regards to the adding that, uh, that third circle. Uh, first, I'll, I will say that um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for our, um, our intelligence uh, personnel from from the, the folks that are that are doing tactical stuff to those that are that are working at a very strategic level um, it is it would be inappropriate for for me as a as a commander to to head on out without really reviewing and understanding really what 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 the environment entails and it's I'm not just talking about weather I'm talking about the in inclusive in in environment that 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 um, uh, that bits and pieces are going to be coming from our intel folks. Um, the thing that 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 bothers me with respect to um, to how the uh, intelligence uh, personnel are are perceived or or the intelligence side of what we do, how that perceived in the United States is. Um, it's it's very disheartening because one you really can't get into an argument about intel. Uh, there are things that people people talk about, and if you're a true intel person, you're not going to go. Well, that's not really how it goes. the The problem though is I think we're really very bad at marketing, um, and we are not. You know, when there's an opportunity to to kind of set the story right, um, we we tend to to not say much and, and just hope that it, that it kind of dies out. The reality though is you have bits and pieces of those things that happen over time. And then it builds this mosaic of, of uh, you have you, the United States and they rely on these folks that are telling you, you know, incomplete stories or incorrect stories, you know? So, so that tarnishes us as well. So it's, it's less of an, an issue about Intel than I think it is an issue about marketing and how we really go back out there and and, and th there I say, say do some damage control. My thoughts. Others. Um, Ian, um, I would say to, it, it really depends on the country. So in countries where we have mature, established, good working relationships between our intelligence agencies, I haven't seen any um, you know changes based on what has come out of Washington regarding the intelligence services. So those are mature relationships. Um, our Intel guys know how to build a personal relationship and those things go on for, for, you know, it's like the mill to mill relationships. Those are the steady cornerstones of, um, of our toolkit. Um, I think for the, to the question of the broader image of the US, you know, nobody believes anything these days from any source. <laughs> Right. So as, as I think it was in your first session where um, one of the senators said, this is the day where truth is an option. It's no longer a requirement. So I feel like nobody, nobody believes anybody. Um, I think there is great trust in but verify in our intelligence uh, products and services from the countries wherein we work closely together in the countries where we have um, not so good relations where we are competitors, then it's a different it's a different game altogether. But I would say um, overall, I don't think the internal the, the dialogue in America on the intelligence services 
um, has not impacted greatly in countries where we've had long-standing relations. So tactical answer. That's a, a very good answer. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that uh, before I, I, I move us to our final thoughts? A, a, a quick moment here. Uh, intelligence collections and the ends, ways, and means of doing so, uh, along with the dissemination and ultimately the interpretation, should be absolutely uncolored. Unfortunately, politically, sometimes that uh, gets disjointed. And it's, it's not that you can always find a lawyer to justify uh, and the accused position, et cetera. This is something more uh, subversive to the national uh, goodwill. And, and we, uh, we need to ensure intelligence uh, services, and I think they do, but I'm hearkening back to the decision for the invasion of Iraq, where I do believe our intelligence services were unduly influenced by political considerations. And, and so we are not above that. And consequently, we suffered overseas. Uh, and, and only time and a series of positive developments to show that we really are on the right side of, of, uh, of intelligence collection and, and are not overly politicized in, its, uh, in, in our product development. Can we recover from that rather large mistake? Thanks very much. Um... I, I welcome uh, either Michael or, or Ambassador Reese to, to uh, speak to, to that in their final comments, but I do wanna bring us uh, towards our closing because we are running out of time. Uh, and so I, I just want to, to raise the issue of the pandemic as, as potentially being an opportunity. Um, we have seen far less interaction uh, at every level of our lives uh, in the last year uh, than we have at any other point in, in any of our lifetimes likely. Um, and that has made it so that we've had to change how we interact, how we engage, and how we even think about doing things that were second nature uh, just uh, 16 months ago. So my question is, does the pandemic provide us an opportunity to rethink or renegotiate or come up with a compromise uh, over how we balance some of these equities that we've been talking about, where we could better leverage expertise because we don't necessarily need to have somebody physically present, or we could uh, find opportunities for engagement because we don't need to now, you know, hire a conference room and, and, uh, and, and all meet up, but actually uh, get on a Zoom for, for half an hour just to, to get to know each other. Um, are there new ways of, of doing things that we could come out of this pandemic and say, uh, we've actually improved our interagency cooperation and our, our positioning for how we engage with other states uh, around the world because we've rethought things. Um, so final thoughts, is there room for compromise? Um, and I'll, I'll go to each of you uh, in the order uh, that, that we started. So uh, Ambassador Holtz, uh, your final thoughts. So thank you very much. Um, overseas, we, we found that getting, we got past the resistance and everybody's absolute, um, you know, loathing of using uh, these types of sessions um, to do our engagements. But once we got past that and got somewhat uh, fluent in using them, we found that um, it, it's cheaper. You can do it quickly. You can have more people. And so we found these tools that we're using today, the Zoom or whatever, um, very effective in doing more and more frequent and even at high level uh, engagement. So that's one thing. A very tactical uh, improvement for state came out of this. Um, we had none of our senior leaders below the secretary and the seventh floor level had classified communications at home. So even as a foreign policy advisor at SOCOM, where I was just an advisor, I had a classified laptop and a classified, at the time, um, BlackBerry. N none of my State Department senior leaders had those. Now they all have them. So now they can dialogue with their interagency counterparts in a secure fashion, 24 hours a day, just like the secretaries can and, and senior military leaders. So those are two tactical things. Yes, I think we constantly need to, um, to, to define our, our national interests. Uh, they're changing all the time, pandemics, environment. Um, Google is a more important entity than many countries in the world, okay? It's got more money, it's got more people, and it's got more influence than a bunch of countries in the world. How do we deal with that? How do we use these things? How do we assess their value to us? So I would say pandemic is just one of many things that we can use to uh, 
evaluate where we need to go and, and learn some lessons from. Thanks very much, Ambassador Reese. So Ian, I'm gonna take your question in a slightly different direction, start with a counterfactual. How would we feel today if it was China that had developed the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine and we were stuck with the Sinovac vaccine in terms of effectiveness? It would be absolutely devastating to our soft power, to our reputation, it's a science and technology powerhouse. It would really put the wind behind the sails of Beijing. So I think the pandemic actually, that aside, I think the pandemic actually did us a great deal of harm because it showed or it accelerated or it highlighted the divisions in the country, the inability to listen to authority, the inability to trust, um, the unnecessary thousands and thousands and thousands of deaths and dislocations. Um, we have suffered a reputational hit. Uh, and then of course, culminating in what happened on January 6th. So I think if the pandemic uh, has led to anything, uh, I hope it's led to a sense that we need to reinvigorate uh, America's domestic structures. Uh, because ultimately uh, we, we work best in the world when we're a model for other people, not by invading and telling them how to, how to do democracy, but actually showing them and encouraging them. And so I think that there's an awful lot of work that we need to do at home uh, and um, we need to be successful at it. We need to be humble, as you said. Turn to, to Vice Admiral Mike Franken, uh, your, your closing thoughts. Well, we learned a year ago, I gave a brief uh, to STRATCOM that has to do with chemical biological warfare, uh, nuclear warfare, and the impl implications to that as a nation, infrastructure down to men and women on the street. But we introduced full spectrum cyber uh, and a host of other issues, taking of space, uh, the, uh, the taking away of the internet, uh, in, uh, infrastructure and power and the like, and the implications of that. So what the pandemic did was it highlighted that as a nation, as a region, as a world, it isn't about the Department of Defense for defense of the nation. It is the strength of our character uh, and the tools that we have as a society from our water supply to our soil health, to our clean air, uh, to our resilience from a power perspective, education, clearness of thought from a media uh, acceptance, uh, and, and politicians who do the Lord's work instead of the party work. And I think that's what uh, Ambassador uh, Reese was getting to, and I agree with that entirely. So the pandemic showed where we need to do better, and I hope to be part of that effort. Thanks for having me on board, Ian. Thank you very much, and I, I uh, appreciate that sentiment wholeheartedly. Uh, Captain Kirk Hibbert, your final thoughts. Um, recognizing that we're short on time, um, nothing substitutes a handshake. Nothing substitutes having tea or coffee with a colleague. Um, I, I do recognize that, um, and I agree with 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 uh, what my other colleagues have uh, mm -hmm. articulated. At, uh, as well, but I, I think that we um, we are going to lose a, a great opportunity if we if if we don't take a look at what we were able to achieve uh, under uh, under the pandemic, so to, to so to speak, recognizing all the science that went behind being able to produce the vaccines and and the like, our ability to communicate uh, and and essentially continue the apparatus moving forward. But we also recognize that there are fractions, there's fissures that, that are in the foundation that goes back to the handshake, that goes back to drinking the coffee or the tea. As long of the, as those things are rock solid, and we need to shore those things back up to continue to build on those opportunities that we, we gained, in a sense, with, with in fact, having to deal with, with the pandemic. Back over to you. Thanks very much. And uh, the final word goes to uh, First Lieutenant Michael Lowe. Yes, so I'm not sure about how the interagency um, community handled it, but here in uh, Eastern Europe, I was here, I've been here for almost a year now. Um, and what we do need to be mindful of is that not all of our allies have the same amount of resources that we have. 
So um, in a country previous to, to Lithuania, those capabilities weren't there. Um, and it really inhibited a lot of our communications with host nation. Uh, luckily here, they do have that capability, the VTC, VTC capability. So we were able to have, for instance, last week a VTC meeting on a very key issue on base here. Um, but again, as uh, Captain Hibbert was saying that nothing substitute that face-to-face uh, -face contact, which is why this week we went and met with the same people and discussed the same topic and we got a better result because that happened. So uh, we can definitely leverage technology, but at the end of the day, I think uh, having boots on ground or shoes on ground in the state, <laughs> in the uh, State Department context, um, it, it is vitally important uh, nonetheless. So. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all of you for a fantastic discussion today. And uh, thank you all for your service as well. Uh, you've all uh, either represented or, or are representing uh, the United States. And, and I know you do it with distinction and great credit. So thank you all very, very much. I, uh, I will just close with the thought that um, you have all highlighted that international relations requires good international relationships. And um, I think it is a, a testament to the careers you are all leading or, or have led uh, that we are uh, still able to stay in touch and have such a great conversation. So thank you all for uh, the time today. Uh, I'm now delighted to welcome uh, our director at the Henry Clay Center, Tom Shelton. Uh, so Tom, thank you very much for being here with us right now and over to you to uh, close us out for the day. Hello, as you heard, my name is Tom Shelton. I am honored to serve as the Executive Director of the Henry Clay Center. We would like to say a big thank you to the members of our panel for engaging in a conversation about this difficult issue and helping all of us to better understand the military and diplomatic roles in U.S. foreign engagement. We would also like to thank Dr. Ian Ralby, Henry Clay Center board member and a direct descendant of Henry Clay for serving as moderator. The Henry Clay Center is a nonprofit bipartisan organization. Since 2007, our mission has focused on civility, discourse, and compromise. We desire to transform the tone of our country's national discourse. We do not seek to change partisan minds, but rather, to inspire current and future leaders to emulate the political legacy of Henry Clay by listening to each other, debating matters of significance and finding common ground through compromise. In addition to events like the Craft of Compromise series, the Henry Clay Center holds annual student Congress events for college and high school students. Alumni of the student Congress events now number over 700 and they serve in a variety of professions, including as elected state and local officials, staffers in the US House and Senate, and as corporate and legal professor professionals in the private sector. If you want to learn more about the Henry Clay Center and help us by supporting our programs and events, please visit henryclaycenter.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Our future Craft of Compromise events will feature topics such as the economic realities of Wall Street versus Main Street and the urban-rural divide. I encourage you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel to see future Craft of Compromise and other Henry Clay Center events. Thank you for engaging with us. Stay tuned. <laughs>